is an exciting morning. We're going to be talking about masterpieces. And here we had a baptism. Then we're going to have our first communicants. It's going to be a great, great morning. And just so you know, we like to keep you on your toes around here. You need to know as much as we do. So when we ask you what's our cue, you just say go. Just go get up there. So anyway, good morning to all of you. I am Dawn Pulgini. For those of you who do not know me, welcome to those online as well. Thank you for joining us. We love you as well. All right, we have a lot of territory to cover today. So I want to start out by asking, how many here, by raise of hands, has a hobby? Anyone have a hobby? I figured so. Okay, now, for those of you who have a hobby, how many of you have a hobby that is artistic in nature? Whether it's music, the arts, you know, yeah, okay, great. Me too. Me too. Over the last few years, this kind of started um, in COVID, during COVID, I got into refinishing furniture. Well, not technically refinishing. At first, I decided that I was going to get pieces of furniture and, you know, paint them. That was kind of the trend. Uh, and it got, a, it got a little out of hand because I started bringing home things that were left on the side of the road. <laughs> and now my husband's like, yeah, I need to get it out of the garage before it snows. So anyway, it started with painting and then after the painting got boring, I decided I would refinish, right? So then I would strip the furniture and I'd sand it down and, and that's been a lot of fun too. But then I thought I'd take it up a notch and I decided to get into a little restoration. Now restoration is a little bit more difficult because you've got gouges and scratches and you got to fill it in with putty and then you got to, you know, sand it down and buff it and do all kinds of things and it becomes a very tedious job. Well, recently I was sweating over my uh, latest project and the text from today came to my mind. So let's check it out. It says here from Ephesians 2.10, Paul writes, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that we can dig deep and discover you in every page. Lord, be with us, be with me. May my words be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I am sure most of you have heard this overused cliche in the Christian community. Just nod your heads if you have, okay? God loves you, and he has a plan, a purpose, and a destiny for your life. Heard that? Yeah, okay. He does, it is overused, but the fact remains that it's true. It, it really is. Each one of us was born on purpose with a God-given purpose to glorify him and make a difference in our generation. Not for ourselves necessarily, but for God, to bring him glory and for others. So Paul says in the verses though, immediately preceding this one that he says, we've been saved by grace through faith not from ourselves, but as a gift from God. Not by works, but for good works. See the difference? You were created on purpose for a purpose. You know, when it comes to conception, there are no accidents regardless of what you've been told. But, Maybe you've been told differently. Maybe someone here has felt the pain of a spouse or a significant other walking away because you were no longer wanted. Maybe you feel abandoned and unloved. Maybe someone here um, was told once that they were a mistake. It, maybe you've been told that your best isn't good enough, and even worse, maybe that you aren't good enough. And as cruel as it sounds, people have been told these things. And those who are on the receiving end of these horrible comments internalize these hate-filled words, and they become, these words become a part of their identity. Their identity is then what? Failure, mistake, broken, unlovely, inept, etc. But I'm here to tell you today that your identity is not 
found in the hurtful words of another. Your identity is found in Jesus Christ. In the beginning, when we go back to Genesis, God created. And we are told that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then if we jump ahead, if we move forward into the New Testament, there are countless scriptures ident- uh, defining our identif- identity in Christ. Today's scripture was one of them, right? We are his masterpiece. Or in other texts, they say, it says workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And if you hop on over to 1 Corinthians 15, it says we bear the image of the man, Jesus, in heaven. And it is because of grace, and what's grace? Grace is what unmerited favor It's not something you did to earn. It's a gift. And I heard one pastor say it this way as I was doing my research. He said that grace is being being awakened from the death sleep. A lot of us grew up with movies, the Disney movies like Sleeping Beauty, right? And what happens, the prince comes in and kisses her and she wakes up from the death sleep. That's grace. And then what happens next? She wraps her arm around the neck, and that is faith. That's what we do when God comes in and he pours out his grace on us. He awakens us from that death sleep, and then we embrace him in faith. It's really a beautiful illustration, I think. And that is the moment. It is in that moment that we become God's masterpiece baptism this morning of Everett. He's God's masterpiece. These first communicants, all of you, can we give them a round? (laughs) Kids, when you said yes to Jesus, you became his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece, created for good works. And what Paul is saying here is that being actually comes before doing. God must do something in you. He must give you a new nature. If you're going to walk in greatness, he has to give you greatness. But, sadly, over the last 50 years or more, this goes against the grain of our culture, doesn't it? And, you know, it used to be called existentialism, but today it's called deconstruction. Some big words here today. And what do these fancy words mean? Well, basically, what they mean is that what I do determines what I am. My actions determine my being. All identity is, you know, incoherent and unstable. All identity is constructed. constructed. No one has an essential nature. You can be who or whatever because nothing means anything. And like all false prophecy, or excuse me, philosophies, not prophecies, like all false philosophies, there is a nugget of truth, which is why it takes a little discerning to know whether it's a false a falsity, or if it's a, if it's a truth, right? Because if it's only a nugget of truth, it isn't the whole truth, which actually makes it an untruth. You can't have a kind of truth. So yes, Christianity has always uh, taught that what you do is what you are. But, and this is a big but, Christianity ultimately says that that what you are must be honored. It must be honored. You can't escape what God made you to be. So, either we are accidents with no essential design or essential nature, or God had an idea specifically for you and me when he knit us together in our mother's womb. And it's our job, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to discover it. And when you do, you will find your true self.
you see, because existentialism and deconstruction say, beer, do whatever, murderer, philanthropist, who cares? But Christianity says, if you're gonna be a person like Christ, God has to give you a nature like Christ. And that, my friends, is how you become God's masterpiece. By grace and faith, you are God's masterpiece. Now here's the fun part. That was the deep stuff, right? Now we're gonna get to the fun part. So this word, masterpiece, or workmanship in other versions, um, is the Greek poem, which is where we get our English word, poem. And it means art. So you are a work of art. You are a work of art. That's what he says. So tell me this. Have you ever seen a masterpiece slashed? When my husband and I were in Italy, we were, uh, went to a museum in Rome, and the entire museum was just full of these original ancient works of art. They were just absolutely spectacular. And I couldn't imagine anyone ever wanting to deface a piece of artwork like that. Occasionally, we hear on the news where someone will go in and they will deface an, an original work of art, right? It's a tragedy. And there's something about an original being slashed that's tragic, wouldn't you say? Think about it. If I were to right now take a knife and run outside to the sign that faces 75th Street and I were to slash it, the one that says fall, you know, the stuff that's going on this fall, and I were to slash it and cut it, I mean, that wouldn't look very nice. That, that would be bad and it would look kind of, it would look bad, right? However, what if I took that same knife and I flew to Paris and I went to the Louvre where the Mona Lisa uh, is hung and I slashed the Mona Lisa? Would that be worse? It would be, right? It would be much worse if I did that. And, and why is it? It's the same slash. I use the same knife. Well, you see, Tim Keller writes, the greatness of the thing slashed determines the degree of tragedy when you gaze upon it. Each one of us is a masterpiece. And this is what God is doing with all of us who have believed in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. First communicants, you're a masterpiece. You are a work of art. And do you know what it means that you are a masterpiece? Do you know what it means that you are a work of art? Well, let me ask you, and I don't want him to put the slide up yet. What is art? Now, I don't want to define it like you would from the dictionary. I want, I want us to describe it. So I'm going to ask you, we're going to take a few seconds here. What is art? How would you describe it? Ready, go. Don't leave me hanging. I'm, I'm filled. What was that? A masterpiece. Yes, what else? What was that? Drawing, art, a reflection, inspiring, hanging, well, a painting. Yes, a painting, exactly. All right, well, here is what Keller says when he talks about masterpieces. He says... Describing art, it's beautiful, it's valuable, and it's the expression of the innermost being of the artist. With nearly 8 billion people on this planet, there is not one other person, not one other person with your fingerprint. You are a masterpiece. You are one of a kind. And Christine Kane, she writes, God made you to be perpetually valuable so that you would be permanently rare. Isn't that great? So I want you to think about that. You are beautiful. You are valuable. And you are an expression of the innermost being of the greatest artist ever. 
You know, I was thinking yesterday as I was preparing that God's love isn't a general kind of love, is it? In, in Ephesians 5, he, he says it's written, Paul says, he gave himself for us. And why? Well, he goes on, he says, that he might sanctify us that he might cleanse us and present us to himself in, get this word, splendor. To present us to himself in splendor, without spot, without wrinkle, but holy and without blemish. On the cross, Jesus did not die in a general way. You know, he didn't die simply to say, I love you, although he does love us, but that isn't all. What he says is, when he died on that cross, he's saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to bleed for your splendor. (laughs) I'm out to turn you into a masterpiece. Now the question is, what do we do with this information? I mean, we can feel pretty good, but what else are we gonna do with this? Well, first, we must rethink how we see and the love of God. We need to rethink the love of God. Have you ever read the quote by C.S. Lewis? I love this one. He writes, you wanted a loving God? Well, you have one. But not a senile old benevolence that drowsily wishes you all to be happy in your own way, but rather, We have a love that is a consuming fire, a love that created the world as persistent, as venerable, as exacting as an artist's love for his work. Do you hear that? Persistent, venerable, exacting. How does an artist look at their work? They sweat over it, right? They honor it. They they cherish it. They bleed over it. They, They give their life to it. And that is how God regards you when you are in Christ. That's why today is such a special day for the children that are the child that is being baptized and the children that are having their first communion. It's a beautiful thing. All right, second, it teaches us how to be good friends, how to be good friends, how to be good spouses, how to be good parishioners to one another, right? When we see our friends as a beautiful masterpiece, we partner with God in the realization of what God has put in each one of them. I don't simply just see the great things about my friend. I see the great things that God wants to do with them. And I celebrate that. I help them mine the jewels hidden within them. I encourage, I speak words of affirmation. I come alongside and lend a hand. I co-partner with God in the development of the splendor of his masterpieces. In Matthew 5, he writes, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your God in heaven. When we join God in the mining process of others, we glorify him. All right, number three, it means that you are changing and growing, right? That's the tough part. We're changing and growing. You you know what? You, You aren't going to stay the same. You can't remain angry and irritable and patient and anxious and bitter and jealous and envious, all those yuck traits, right? Because you're changing and you can't escape it. Real grace and real faith equals progress. Jesus didn't die so that we could just remain the same. He bled for our splendor. All right, last point. Number four, if God's the sculptor, 
he may be coming after you with a very big chisel. I should have warned you, <laughs> right? You know, do you know that our troubles are often a result of God's chiseling? Do you know that an excellent sculptor will rarely, rarely say that they put beauty into the piece of marble, but rather they will say that they brought the beauty out? This too reminded me of my trip to Italy when my husband and I were in Florence and we went to see the David. Anybody see the David? It's magnificent. You could just stare at him all day long. He's incredible and he's huge. And do you know when, that, when Michelangelo saw that hunk of marble, all the other sculptors were like, nah, that's garbage. We don't, nah, that, you can't do anything with that. That's a piece of junk marble. That's not a good quality and it's not good. And Michelangelo said, oh yeah? Guess what? I'm gonna draw the beauty out of it. Friends, God is turning you into something beautiful. But in the process, the work of art may not always look so good. In the field of psychology, doctors have asked nature or nurture. And the answer is actually both. Because both are brushes of God. But this isn't something that we need to fret over, right? Because what has gone into our culture or to our chromosomes has been used. Everything that has been brought into our lives, both good and bad, will be used by the great artist to turn us into a great masterpiece. A unique diamond in his crown. There are people that only you can help. There are good deeds that only you can do. There are people's lives that only you can change. And why is that? Because of everything that has gone into your life, you are his workmanship and so is your neighbor. So as we prepare to go the, to the table, I'm gonna close by pausing. I'm gonna ask everyone to stand up. If you're watching online and you are not alone, stand up, everybody in the room. And now, I want you to turn and I want you to look at the masterpiece behind you. Go ahead. <laughs> now you're looking at the back of their heads. All right, now I want you to turn and look at your, the masterpiece, the masterpieces beside you. All right, back to me. Now you get to turn and look at this masterpiece, right? I told the earlier service I didn't even plan that, but once you turn around, you're just looking at me. So there you go, right? <laughs> as we take one step forward as a church, we join hands with one another and with God as we walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This, friends, is how you will discover your purpose. This is how you will find your true identity, a masterpiece in the hands of a great artist. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, who are we that you would be mindful of us? Who are we, Lord, that you would take us lowly sinners and turn us into marvelous, beautiful, masterpieces. We thank you for your deep and unending love. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.